Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Neeraj Shah. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Wambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Wambrew and I are delighted to join everyone today to provide an update on all things COVID-19 all across the state of Maine for today, Tuesday, August 11th, 2020. We begin today's meeting on a sad note. Maine CDC is reporting the passing of a woman in her 90s from York County with COVID-19. Her passing marks the 126th death in Maine of individuals who are suffering from COVID-19. As we always do, we offer our deepest condolences to her family, her friends, and her community during this time of their grief. Overall, Maine CDC is currently reporting 4,050 cases of COVID-19 across the state, a net increase of one case since yesterday. Of those cases, 3,644 are confirmed, an increase of three cases, and 406 are probable, a decrease of two. Right now in the state of Maine, there are nine individuals who are in the hospital, four of whom are in the ICU and one of them on a ventilator with COVID-19. And since beginning our activation of COVID-19, 3,560 individuals have been classified as recovered, an increase of 23 cases. Of our cases, 922 are among healthcare workers. And of those healthcare workers with COVID-19, 858 have been found to be recovered. I'd like to take a moment to pause on some of those numbers and provide a bit of perspective around them. With just one new net total case today and several days over the past two weeks with single digit increases, these results, these latest numbers are encouraging, especially in light of the growth in, of COVID-19 cases in other parts of the country, including here in the Northeast. But as we've seen with the COVID-19 epidemic, What's going on in other states could very quickly arrive and find its way here in Maine. These encouraging numbers could very quickly and easily change. But at the same time, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone in Maine for their strong efforts over the past seven months now. We are where we are with respect to, to COVID-19 because of those efforts, not despite them. But our goal right now is to try to stay at this level. That is, after all, why we've all been working so hard across the state, wearing face coverings, physically distancing from one another, practicing things like covering our coughs, good hand hygiene. All of those things have collectively brought our case numbers to where they are right now. Now, I'll be the first to admit, it's hard to keep doing good when you've been doing good for so long. But the point is right now, we have to keep both our feet on the gas and stay focused on the same types of activities that have got us here, like continuing to wear face coverings, continuing to keep physically distanced from one another, continuing to stay home if you're not feeling well, continuing all of the good healthful behaviors that have brought our numbers to where we are today. I'd like to take a moment to provide an update on some of the outbreaks next that Maine CDC has been working on. Let's start with some of the outbreaks associated with agricultural sites across the state. At Hancock Foods, there have been a total of 12 cases now. At the Merrill Farm, a total of nine cases, and at Wyman's, a total of five cases to date. Those farms are in different stages of their outbreak. At Hancock, for example, Individuals have completed their entire cycle of isolation and are beginning the process of being classified as recovered and thus returning to work. At the other farms, they're in their various stages of testing. We continue to work with our partners at Maine Mobile Health, who have been instrumental in helping Maine CDC and DHHS 
provide public health as well as social services to all the affected employees of those farms. As those situations change on the ground, we'll continue to keep everyone updated. I'd like to next pro to provide a quick update on one of the outbreaks at a long-term care facility that we've been working with. That is the Marshwood Center in Lewiston. There are a total of 38 cases at the Marshwood Center right now. Closely related to the Marshwood outbreak is an outbreak at Central Maine Medical Center, where there are a total of 15 cases. Maine CDC continues to work with both facilities to offer testing, infection control guidance, and other public health supports as they work their ways through these outbreaks. I'd like next to provide a brief update on where things stand with respect to testing across the state. Let's first start with the positivity rate. I'll start by talking about yesterday's positivity rate first. Based on a total of 1,547 PCR tests reported to Maine CDC, yesterday's one day positivity rate was 0.71%. The number that we really focus on is not just the one day number, but the seven day average number. That number in Maine right now is 0.73%. For comparison, the national average of seven day positivity rates across the country hovers at approximately 8% right now. I'd also like to provide a brief update on where things stand with respect to testing numbers among individuals from other states. As of this morning, there have been 181 individuals with an out-of-state residence who have tested positive in Maine. All told, there have been 3,825 total tests conducted on out-of-state residents, and again, 181 of those 3,825 results have been positive. It's important to keep in mind that these results are out of 191,000 total test reports that have been reported to Maine CDC. I'd like to now turn things over, to, I'm, I'm sorry, one final metric before I turn things over to Commissioner Wambrou. In terms of our testing volume, right now in Maine, we are conducting approximately 177 tests for every 100,000 people across the state. That number has stayed steady for a few days now, but as we have more and more swab and send sites that are coming online, we anticipate that number increasing. Now I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Wambrew for an update on funding. Great, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Today, the Mills Administration announced that it has approved an additional $4 million in grants to more than 80 municipalities and tribal government governments across the state to support local COVID-19 public health, education, and prevention efforts. Approximately half of the awards will go to new applicants, while the others will be benefit returning municipalities. In late June, Maine awarded approximately $9 million to nearly 100 municipalities. In total, this Keep Maine Healthy funding will benefit 132 municipalities and two tribal governments, representing about 1 million people or 75% of the state's year-round population. We thank Maine cities, towns, and tribal governments for their partnership in protecting Maine people and visitors against the spread of COVID-19. This funding has supported their innovative responses on the front lines of the pandemic and will continue to bolster this critical work into the fall. Specifically, this initiative supports three types of activities. The first is public education. This includes, but is not limited to, posting COVID-19 prevention information, creating signs, and developing websites. Second, the awards will support physical distancing and related measures. This could include posting signs for physical distancing in public spaces, providing staff to limit crowds in front of restaurants, and purchasing personal protective equipment and hand sanitizer to be made available for staff, visitors, and the public. Third, the initiative supports local business assistance. 
Each municipality or tribal government will designate a local contact for educating local businesses on best public health practices. The Mills administration worked closely with the Maine Municipal Association and the Mayor's Coalition on the creation of this program. Each grant varies in size and scope. For example, Sanford is hiring two park safety ambassadors to provide education and funding 10 virtual learning sites to provide education for elementary school children in aftercare settings. Bethel proposes a Keep Healthy, Keep Open campaign featuring illustrations of a masked moose character delivering a serious message in a fun way. And the Penobscot Nation will use this funding to provide a pathway to increase health literacy surrounding COVID-19. These local actions will be an extension of Maine CDC's work to prevent the spread of COVID-19 as part of the Keep Maine Healthy Initiative. Costs associated with approved activities from August 1st through October 31st, 2020 will be reimbursed. And the awards are supported by the Coronavirus Relief Fund from the CARES Act and are distributed um, to communities as they implement these programs. This award comes at a time when Maine Adjusted for Population ranks third lowest in the nation in terms of positive cases, eighth lowest in the nation in terms of deaths, third lowest in terms of patients ever hospitalized out of the 36 states reporting, and fourth highest in terms of the percentage of people who have recovered out of 45 states reporting. As Governor Mills stated, while she is proud of that progress, we cannot let our guard down. With these additional grants, our administration will continue to support municipalities as they work to educate the public on the dangers of COVID-19, implement and encourage compliance with public health and safety guidelines, and protect all Maine people and visitors. So with that, Dr. Shaw, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Great, thank you, Commissioner. We will turn now to our friends in the media, and we'll turn first to Joe Waller at the Press Herald. Uh, yes, hi, thanks for taking our phone calls today. Um, two questions. <clears throat> One is, um, there's been a lot of discussion about these uh, cheap uh, $1 at-home tests that have yet to be approved by the FDA, but they will be soon. Um, considering the low virus prevalence in Maine, do you still, if those are approved by the FDA, do you still see those as having a, a role in addressing the pandemic here. And um, uh -huh. my, um, my sec I'll just go ahead and ask my second question. My second question is um, Vermont today announced uh, that uh, fall high school sports and one of the most interesting things they said is football would be seven on seven touch or flag. Um, is something like that being considered for Maine? Thank you. Sure thing, Joe. So I'll, I'll start with the first question. Um, it's it's uh, our team has been discussing that exact test and the exact strategy that has been proposed attendant to that test. We think it's got a role, um, not just in Maine, but elsewhere. We're examining a lot of similar strategies that are all predicated on testing that might be a little less sensitive than the gold standard PCR test that we use, say at our lab here in Augusta, but if done rapidly and successively enough, would still catch people, even if their level of virus were not high enough the first time. So we think that it would have a possibility. But as you, as you noted, one of the things you always have to keep in mind when you're thinking about how well a test will work is how prevalent the thing that you're testing for is in the population. And here in Maine, with a low prevalence, it's a trade-off that we really have to think about because what we might end up with is missing individuals or rather in this case, getting false positives among individuals who aren't actually positive. Really, what we need to see is the full array of testing data that would be submitted to FDA. Of course, as your question noted, Joe, that hasn't been done yet. And so once we get a sense of what those data are, we'll be able to create a model that looks at something called the positive predictive value. And that'll really help us figure out whether it's appropriate for Maine or whether it ought to be reserved for a higher prevalence type of setting. So right now, we're examining every single new test and new testing strategy that's coming down the market, but keeping in mind the unique dynamics, the low dynamics of transmission here in Maine as we, may, as we do that analysis. Um, as for the school sports, let me, uh, Commissioner Wambrew and I have been uh, discussing that issue. I'll turn it over to Commissioner Wambrew. Sure. On the topic of fall sports, 
our understanding is the Maine Principals Association has delayed the start of fall sports to sometime in September. We are closely monitoring their work and looking at what other states have done as well. So we are we are watching and looking in to see what might or might not be possible, recognizing on one hand, we have to balance out the public health risk of sports. On the other hand, we know physical activity is important to people's health as well. So we continue to monitor this situation. Has touch football been discussed? Is this part of the discussion? I defer your question to the Principals Association. I'm going to turn now to Megan from WMTW. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. My question is about um, starting school and with the state's six requirements for <clears throat> reopening schools, um, one of them includes the return to school after illness guidelines. So, you know, anybody with kids knows on a normal year, kids get sick. Um, but this year, let's say a student does contract coronavirus, they find, you know, it's a student in a school who's been in in-person learning. What is the state's recommendation for how the school handles that, including balancing the privacy of that student? Because you, you would have to notify, I would assume, parents. Um, but how do you keep the privacy of that student and still maintain the safety of the, the larger student body? Sure. So, Megan, I'll, I'll start by noting that balancing privacy interest with literally the public health is what we do every single day as we're investigating outbreaks. We're always balancing the need of the broader public to know about what's going on with the need to protect individuals as privacy. Protecting that privacy is important. If your privacy is going to be compromised, you may not be willing to go to the doctor. You may not be willing to talk to public health officials about folks you've been in contact with. So we take that obligation very seriously and it's what we balance every single day. Going into the school year with respect to COVID-19, we've already had extensive discussions internally, as well as with the Department of Education about how we would approach students from a public health perspective who have symptoms of COVID-19, as well as potentially even being diagnosed with COVID-19. And we're developing, working with the US CDC protocols for how we would go about that. But in general, the same approach we take, say, in any public setting would apply in a school. That is to say, individuals, students, or teachers who might be close contacts of any child who is tested positive may have to be, te may have to be out of school for a while uh, during their period of quarantine. That information can be communicated without necessarily revealing the identity of the child. It's possible to say, tell a classroom of individuals that they may have to be out for a period without revealing which child actually tested positive. Now, this is a discussion that will have to be had in concert with school officials and the Department of Education. But again, this is what we do as we investigate any type of outbreak. We're always balancing privacy with the greater public health good. Can I ask a quick follow-up just about um, PPE in schools? Um, sure. I know that it's been distributed to some schools. I know the uh, Maine CDC is helping out certain districts and places where they need it, if they need it or want it. Um, do you anticipate all of the orders to be filled by when most of the um, districts decide they want to go back to school, which is kind of looking like, you know, early to mid-September? Sure. It really does depend on what the nature of those orders and requests is. Thus far, we've been working with schools to fill them, uh, but we have to see what the remainder of the orders comes in, Megan. So I, I don't want to necessarily say that they will all be filled. We are working very closely with schools. PPE, of course, is not necessary for every single school. In fact, what the guidelines recommend are other forms of distancing that may in fact serve a, a role that PPE doesn't. That is to say things like plexiglass, things of that sort. Face coverings are where we've been focused. The face covering element is one that we believe is really essential as is noted in our guidelines. That's what we've been working with schools on to fill as many of their orders. We've actually been working most directly with the Department of Education because they've got a better sense of what the needs are at each individual school. Got it, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Don, the once and future King Kerrigan. <laughs> Good 
afternoon, Dr. Shah. Nice to uh, be back and talk to you again. Uh, I've got a, a couple of questions about out-of-state folks uh, with COVID-19, potentially with COVID-19 here in Maine. So I have a question and a follow-up, please. The quest, first question is, we continue to hear uh, comments and concerns raised by people living in tourist areas of Maine as wondering, with all the influx of people here, despite quarantine requirements, how many more cases of COVID-19 are there in Maine than are reported or that we know about? Are there, we saw the MDI situation, I believe last week, five people uh, estimated who had been actually tested and found positive in other states, learning it only after they got here. How many more of those do you think are out there in Maine? And do you think that the number of out-of-state residents tested positive here accurately reflects the number who are here? Sure, Don. So let's, let's, I think where I'd like to start with that is by reviewing what, what Governor Mills's travel guidelines are as laid out in the various executive orders. Because when you take a look at those, the individuals that you noted, Don, should either in principle not be here or if they are here, should be in isolation inside at the time they receive their results. So individuals who are coming here from one of the states where a negative test is required or a 14-day quarantine was required should either have a negative test in hand or if they're waiting for their result, should be in quarantine until such time that result comes back as negative. If they have a positive, which as we understand has happened in, a, in, in about five instances on MDI, those individuals should isolate for the entire duration of their illness. In fact, in adding on a number of days until after their symptoms have resolved. Anybody who gets any sort of test on top of that should be in quarantine until their results come back, no matter what state they're coming into, but are coming in from. But, but Don, you know, to answer your question, what I think is important to note is that nationwide, there is no GPS tracking for individuals who have tested positive in any state, including in Maine. So it is theoretically possible that there could be someone who got tested in another state, found out that they were positive, and then decided to come to Maine. There, there wouldn't be a GPS system that alerts Maine CDC when those individuals come across the border. But what I think is important to note is that Ever since Maine CDC has been keeping statistics on COVID-19, as I mentioned a moment ago, there have been a total of 181 tests that have been positive among out-of-state individuals out of 191,000 total tests. The other thing that I think is important to note is that at this point in the summer, here we are on August 11th, we have not seen systematic evidence of individuals from other states who tested positive, who then came to Maine and then caused outbreaks here in Maine. It could happen to be sure, but thus far in the summer, we haven't seen evidence of those outbreaks. So for example, in the zip code where Bar Harbor is in 04609, there are not currently any active cases of COVID-19. So my, I guess the follow-up would be to that, um, yeah, so it sounds like you're pretty confident of, uh, that you know what's out there and are there, do you, so are the people who are expressing these concerns worried for no reason? No, uh, Don, we share their concern. And what we can say is that in any outbreak situation, whether you're talking about folks in the state or folks coming in from out of the state, in any outbreak, no matter the type of outbreak, we're only seeing a portion of all the cases that are out there. It is absolutely possible that there may be individuals who have come into Maine with a positive test result uh, and, and have come across the border and, and are here in Maine right now. That is absolutely possible and we share that concern. We sh they are required to follow Governor Mills's executive orders and quarantine until they get a negative result or stay in isolation until after their illness is over. So we absolutely share that concern. We think it's, but, but I think it's also important to put that concern in context. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn now to Morgan at WABI. 
Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. My uh, first question is sort of similar to the last one. This was a question from a viewer and hoping that you could provide some clarity. Since agricultural workers are not from Maine, they are not included in our county. So is it accurate to say that we really do not have any idea how many people in Hancock and Washington County have COVID-19? And then I have another question after that. Um, sure, Morgan, uh, one of the assumptions in your question is incorrect. Agricultural workers who come to Maine, list their, they, they, if they list their state of residence as being as part of Maine, they're listed in our case count. But above and beyond that, Maine CDC has decided that as to any incoming agricultural worker, irrespective of what they list as their state of residence, they will be counted under Maine's case counts. Great, thank you. And uh, so when someone who is from Maine dies or gets sick with coronavirus outside of the state, how long does it take to add that to our case count? Sorry, so Morgan, you're asking about someone who is a Maine resident, but not currently resident in the state of Maine? Yes. So that depends on the state in which that individual passed away and their state health department or their vital records department informing the Maine CDC vital records department that an individual who is a Maine resident has passed away in their jurisdiction. And that varies dramatically state by state. Some states use an electronic reporting system, as does Maine. And so that can happen a little bit more quickly on the order of weeks. Other states may not, in which case it may take several weeks. But there's, it really does depend on which state the has to pay in and how many, how many out-of-state reports that they've got. Can I ask quickly, is that happening often? Has that happened often? It, it happens quite frequently that individuals who are Maine residents may be elsewhere temporarily and pass away. So that's, that, is, that is a common occurrence irrespective of COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Jay Mishkin at WGME. Uh, hello. So with the main numbers, our numbers in Maine now being so good, both the uh, positivity rate and the number of cases, is there a threshold that the state is looking to achieve before bars and other larger facilities will be allowed to open? Or are they those businesses basically going to be waiting out the rest of the country to sort of get its act together and get the numbers down so we don't see a situation of growth up here? Well, Jay, I'll start. I want to have, make sure Commissioner Lambert weighs in on this as well. But, you know, Jay, I think this is a good time to talk about the fact that Maine is not an island in this respect. Uh, what we see, even though there are encouraging epidemiological signs in Maine, we simultaneously see states that are 100 miles away seeing significant increases in the number of new cases, in the positivity rates, and those cases that are occurring elsewhere in the Northeast, to say nothing of Florida, Texas, and California, those states, sorry, those cases that are brewing there could easily find their way to Maine. And so while we're encouraged by these results, for me personally, they're a sign that we've got to keep going in the direction that we've been going because what's happening in other states could easily find its way here. In that respect, we are not an island. We are still very much connected to what's happening elsewhere in the Northeast. I'll add that while our overall numbers are positive, we do have pockets of disparities. We know, for example, that people of color in Maine are significantly more likely to contract COVID-19. So we continue to have work to do. Just today, we put out the application for the Health Equity Improvement Initiative, which Governor Mills announced about 10 days ago. It will provide up to $1 million for community-based organizations that are run by or led by people of color to be able to provide those kinds of interpreter translation services social supports to keep people in isolation and quarantine, as well as help them recover that are critical to trying to lessen the disparity. So while the numbers are good overall, we still have more work to do within those numbers. So from a bar owner perspective, and obviously as the weather changes here, outdoor service will become more limited. But from a bar owner perspective, is it fair for them to assume that they may not be able to do indoor service until there's a vaccine? Is that, is that a realistic approach? Look, 
we are all in this pandemic learning experience, trying to understand how our transmission is affected by our different public health practices. We continue to try to expand our testing capacity. For example, we now have 18 swab and send sites that are open throughout the state of Maine. Northern Light has 10 sites that are all now open beginning this week. We also are continuing to expand our contact tracing. So it's both a mix of the transmission of the disease and what we know and learn about it, as well as how we're prepared to prevent the spread that affects our business reopening decisions. So I think it's too early to say, to say what will and won't happen this fall. I agree with that. It, what we've seen in other states is that opening before there had been a, a firm and tight lid on COVID-19 generated the second wave or the second spike in many of those jurisdictions. That spike in many instances, I think in all instances, was larger than the very first one. So I, I think, although I understand the, the concern as well as the question, Jay, we're in a situation where I think the focus has to be on keeping a lid on things from an infectious disease perspective. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Uh, thanks, Dr. Shaw. I wanted to ask your reaction to the finding from the American Academy of Pediatrics that cases of COVID-19 among children has increased by 40% over the past couple of weeks. And what can you tell us about what we know in Maine in terms of um, you know, we categorize these youngest cases from ages zero to 20. Do we know within that range, are they affecting, or are certain ages, are we seeing more cases than others? Sure, Patty. So let's take a look at the numbers first. Um, as of this morning, there are a total of 371 cases of COVID-19 in children 19 years of age and below. Uh, in, ju in July alone, to accord with what was in the AAP report, uh, in that same time frame, there were 104 cases in Maine in children 19 years of age and younger throughout that same time period. Of those, thus far, 23 have been in cases and have been in children who were younger than the age of 10. Uh, and just to provide a bit more glimpse into that, of the 371 cases, 300 have been confirmed and 70 are probable. So what we really see is that although children in Maine are affected in the same way and largely at the same rate as in other states, that is to say about nine or so percent of cases, they do tend to be children aged 10 to 19, fewer rates of children under the age of 10. Um, you know, what, I, what I'll say uh, without going into it too terribly much, what I'll say is when we think about children, um, and particularly in the context of schools, we generally think of two things. First is, what is the risk to children? And then what is the risk from children? With respect to the former, the risk of COVID-19 to children, there is no question that children can get COVID-19. As compared to adults, their symptoms tend to be milder, their duration of illness tends to be a little bit shorter, and their overall course of disease is not as severe as that in adults. That being said, when children need to be hospitalized, there can be rare complications that can be very severe for them. As to the latter question, which is what is the risk from children? The data there are uneven and mixed and not all in yet. But based on a review that was published not too long ago, the, the risk of COVID from children seems to be less than from other adults. Now, there are some data to, that suggests that older children transmit COVID at about the same rate as adults, but younger children seem thus far to be less able to transmit COVID to older adults. I mean, these, the fact, oh, sorry. The no, fact that um, there has been a, an increase, does that change the thinking at all in terms of the guidelines or plans for schools reopening? Well, you, you know, you, you framed that as an increase, Patty, and we were trying to, we have to determine whether it's an actual increase or a function of greater testing or um, the fact that providers are now focusing on children in different ways as children are getting ready to come back to school. So that's one of the unanswered questions, both in our data as well as in the AAP report. It's certainly a numerical increase on paper, but 
the biological significance of that increase is still something that all epidemiologists are trying to get a handle on. Make no mistake, it definitely um, it, it, it definitely factors in to how we think about return to school, particularly on that former question, which is to say the risk to children. Uh, earlier on in, in the in the pandemic, by earlier on I mean you know March or April, uh, there were it was unclear as to whether children were affected at all. But what we know now is that children can be affected. So the risk to children, we have a much better sense and characterization of, and that absolutely factors into how we think about any return to school. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn next to Liz Graves. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Couple of questions today. The first one is about uh, back to out-of-state cases, of course. Um, <laughs> I'm curious whether there's any been any discussion about um, with all of the communication and, and public education efforts to, to visitors from, from public and private groups, whether there's been thought about asking visitors to voluntarily report to local hospitals or public health if they find themselves in the situation that that five or so people did recently that they discover their test. Presumably many people do because they're sick and they want to know what to do, but if the, has there been discussion about the state actually asking, hey, if you get a, a test, in addition to isolating, please let someone know? Sure. So what we've, what we've urged, as with any infectious disease, is that if you're not feeling well, you want to make sure you're reaching out to some sort of healthcare provider. It may be your physician back home. It may be a healthcare provider here in Maine. Uh, given the higher concentration of, of out-of-state visitors on MDI, that's why we've started working with MDI Hospital. What we want to avoid is double counting of cases, though. Uh, so if folks are reporting to their home state and then they're simultaneously reporting to the state of Maine, we have to make sure we're not double counting and artificially inflating the number of cases in both jurisdictions. Uh, but what we've seen in other states, for the most part, is that individuals, the, I think the most important thing that individuals from out of state can do is make sure they abide the guidance to stay inside if they get a negative, a positive test back and not go outside or interact with anyone until such time they get a negative test back. That is really the key uh, to making sure that there's not further transmission from anybody who ends up testing positive. Awesome, thank you. So my other question, totally different side of all this, is about, um, curious about um, uh, reports this week about different kinds of face coverings, and this has implications for workplaces and also for schools. So presumably, almost any face covering is better than no face covering, but uh, what are your thoughts on the relative of efficacy of neck gaiters and face masks and bandanas? And face shields. Also. Yes. Okay. So here's here's the bottom line. If you take your face covering and you stretch it out and you can see straight through it or even see what's going on behind it, it is not suitable as a, as a face covering. And that's what neck gaiters end up being. Neck gaiters are great. They keep us warm. They're great when you're out jogging. But when you stretch them out, I mean, the, the reason that neck gaiters are comfortable and fit well is because they stretch out. But that same action of being stretched out can let respiratory droplets from you spread into the air, utterly defeating and negating the entire purpose of having a face covering on. This has been advice that's been out there, but not too long ago, a set of researchers from Duke did proper physics studies to really quantify this. And what they found matched what we all sort of figured, which is if you can see through the thing that's supposed to be keeping droplets from infecting other people, it's probably not doing a good job at what it's supposed to be doing. What, I, what we recommend is use a face covering that is designed to be a face covering. That doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be medical grade, although that's fine. But a face covering, many of which are now being made in Maine by Maine manufacturers, are stu they're sturdy, they're firm, they're not translucent, and they'll do the job of protecting other people if you happen to have COVID-19. Awesome, thank you. A quick follow-up from uh, related from a reader wanted us to ask uh, for schools, but also workplaces. Is there guidance about um, long hair? Is is for 
particles landing on hair, is it better to have long hair tied back or is it better to have short hair if you're in a place where you're around a lot of other people? I don't, I don't think the US CDC has firm guidance on the extent to which hair length or, or things of that nature may tilt the balance one way or the other with respect to COVID. Okay, thank you very much. You bet, Liz. I'm gonna turn now to Charlie at the BDN. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, uh, two questions. My first is about uh, PPE. I'm curious, could you tell me um, just kind of an overview uh, going back? I, I realize there are a lot of these questions sort of in the early stages of the p pandemic, but how uh, the state of Maine has um, evaluated the needs for PPE around the state uh, and, you know, how it has decided what PPE to distribute to what organizations and businesses and that sort of thing? Sure thing, Charlie. So let's let's take a look at the numbers first. Ever since Maine CDC started shipping PPE to providers across the state, we have filled nearly 2,800 orders uh, of PPE for healthcare providers across the state. Uh, to put that number in numerical perspective, that is 2.3 million pieces of PPE that have been distributed as of this morning. There's actually 18,500 pieces that are on the trucks just today alone. The way that we went about deciding what sorts of PPE to focus on was to listen to healthcare providers. We listened to what healthcare providers were telling us with respect to how they were implementing the US CDC infection control practice guidelines. That led us very early on to focus on things like N95 respirators, surgical masks, gowns, gloves, things of that nature that healthcare providers told us they needed in order to continue taking care of patients. Based on that feedback, that's where we focused our procurement efforts. With respect to how we made those decisions, similarly, we looked at where healthcare providers were providing services and where those services needed to continue with unabated. So that very quickly led us to situations like long-term care facilities, local fire rescue and EMS agencies, and local hospitals. We're continuing as we now think about the longer phases of COVID-19 to take a look at our PPE, both our supplies as well as how we're distributing it. But that's, that's how we got to where we are. Great. Um, and then speaking of sort of the longer phases, I'm, my next question is about uh, you know, we're at this point where schools will be opening soon and, uh, you know, colder weather will be coming and, um, you know, a lot of other states have had surging flare-ups of, of COVID. And I, I, I guess, do you have any sort of uh, like best and worst case scenarios for what Maine could look like in the next three, four, five, six months in terms of whether cases will pick back up and how that would affect hospitals and that sort of thing or whether our current levels could continue. Um, Charlie, as you know, I, I can't speculate on what the future might hold, especially in a rapidly changing situation like the COVID-19 pandemic. What I can tell you is that we are preparing and remain prepared for the possibility that the COVID-19 situation in Maine could go the way as it has in some other states. So with specific example or, or specific focus on PPE, even though we have been pushing out over 2 million pieces of PPE, we've simultaneously been making sure that our state's reserve of PPE remains healthy so that if a situation as has unfolded in other states were to take hold in Maine, we would be able to keep the supply of PPE to vital healthcare institutions like long-term care facilities, hospitals. We would be able to keep that going we don't know what the future will hold, but our job is to prepare for that and make sure we're ready no matter what course it goes. Thank you. I'm gonna turn now to Amy Brown, WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. In an email to the media this morning, the director of the Waldo County EMA said that, quote, in reviewing the mask order compliance and death rates, there doesn't seem to be a correlation, end quote. And what he offers for support is a list of the states that have mask orders and the rates there, which doesn't necessarily indicate compliance levels. We've reached out to him to follow up as well, but what are your thoughts about that? Have there been 
there have been lab studies we know about droplets, you know, looking at the different kinds of mass, but have there been any uh, studies on rates of death or contracting COVID among people who were wearing masks versus not wearing masks? Are the case investigators checking into that? Um, so, Amy, what I what I will say is, first of all, I have not seen the email that you reference, but what I will say though is that there have now been a number of peer-reviewed academic publications that have examined the efficacy of masks or face coverings, both at the molecular, sorry, at the structural level, uh, kind of going back to the question we talked about a moment ago uh, with Liz about whether different face coverings actually protect. Uh, or prevent the spread of COVID-19, as well as at a correlational population health level. Uh, I've tweeted out or posted a lot of those. Um, these are not secretive studies. They've been published in publicly accessible peer-reviewed journals, and not just fly-by-night journals. They've been published in some of the most prestigious medical and scientific journals in the world, like the Lancet, the British Medical Journal, Nature, and Science. So uh, th this, is, this is not something that... Um, has, has been done under cover of night. It's been publicly made available and done in a peer reviewed fashion. That support that masks do reduce the rates, is that what you're saying? That is correct. Okay. And uh, from a listener, now that a listener asked, now that we have the luxury of seeing what's happening in other states where kids have already returned to school and some schools are already shutting down again because of positive tests, is there any way the state could put some kind of system in place for testing? Uh, before return to school and then periodically once the, of not just the kids, but also the staff once they're back at school? Sure. So Amy, you know, Commissioner Lambert and I have discussed this issue as well. Uh, we're still working with the Department of Education as we think about what any sort of testing regime may look like. No final decisions have been made, uh, but it's something that's very much under discussion with our colleagues at DOE. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the final question for the afternoon goes to Patrick Whittle. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. Thank you uh, for taking the question. Um, a couple of my questions were answered already because I'm here at the end of the line, so thank you for that. Um, I'm curious, if today we only had a net increase of one case, I believe. I'm, I'm curious if you know or, or have the capacity to find out when the last time we had a zero a day was and um, and also, um, I'm very interested in this masked moose character, and I would love to be able to get a rendering of what it's going to look like, and I would love to know where in the community it's going to be found, because it sounds like a fun idea. Yeah, let, let, me, let me start, Patrick, by, by sharing your, um, your, your affection and curiosity about the masked moose. Um, I, I'm not sure what, this, what this, this mystical moose will look like, but um, I can't wait to find out more. So I'm with you on that. Uh, in terms of the case counts, um, we'll, I mean, we're going to double check so I don't provide you incorrect information right now, but I do not believe um, we have had a, a zero day since we've had a single case, which is to say all the way going back to early March. But I don't believe there has been a day that we recorded either no new cases or a net total of no new cases, but I'm going to go back and double check that. There have been many days where we had very few cases, of course. Some of those have been more recently, but to your exact question, Patrick, uh, rather than speculate, I'll, we'll double check and I'll make sure I get it right for you. Is it reasonable to describe a day like today where we have a net positive of one as a day where the count grew by one? Because I, I believe the, the actual number of new cases is six, but then five were reclassified. So I, I just want to make sure I'm describing it in the most accurate way possible. Yeah. So uh, Patrick, so there were three additional confirmed cases, which are cases or individuals in whom there has been a PCR laboratory diagnosis. But at the same time, there was a decrease of two of the probable cases. Most of the time, when there's a decrease in the number of probable cases, that is because an individual who was a close contact of a confirmed case got went and got tested and ended up testing negative. And so they were initially classified as a probable case because they were a close contact of a confirmed case and had symptoms. So they were on our probable list. And then they got tested. And then they may have fallen because they tested negative. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what happened in these two cases, but most of the time when there is a decrease in probables, that's what's happened. 
So an increase of three confirmed, a decrease of two probables gets us our net growth of one case. And I would like to add, going back to your other part of your question, we all want a sighting of the moose. Um, Loretta Powers, the Bethel Tile Manager, has put together with her team a proposal that will include a live, ca live costume character who will visit schools and businesses because, as they say, there is always a lot of buzz about seeing a moose. But it's a serious message that is trying to get, it, get to people in a clever way, which is we have to remain vigilant. Um, while these numbers are positive, they are positive only because of the ongoing use of cloth face coverings, physical distancing, hand hygiene, and all the practices that do take extra work. And that extra work is harder when the numbers look good and it's sunny out, but is especially important now as we do have more visitors in the state, we are engaging in new ways that we continue that public health, those basic public health measures that have gotten Maine to the place we are today. So thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, Commissioner, that was the last question for the afternoon. Anything further on your end? No, I just want to again say thank you to all those town managers, city managers, uh, tribal leaders who have rolled up their sleeves. The fact that we had such high participation amongst our partners in local communities shows how much they care. So we really appreciate that extra effort to keep Maine safe. Great. Well, thank you on behalf of Commissioner Lambrou and myself. We appreciate everyone taking some time this afternoon and joining us. We look forward to chatting again on Thursday. In the meantime, as always, please be kind and take care of one another. We'll talk again soon.